Hello and welcome back to GED Live at PALS. Today we're going to bring you a video discussing the GED social studies questions and techniques for getting them correct. So I'd like to say that my golden rule for the GED questions is making sure that you understand the question. It's pretty common for test takers to either get nervous or get in their decisive drive where they're moving at a pretty quick pace and to read the question quickly and perhaps not totally understand it. And some of the questions are set up in a way that makes that easier than others. So my, I'm going to go through my four tips for uh, understanding the questions. The first one is when you read the questions, take your time. Read each question very carefully. So we want to make sure that we know what the question wants. The question is asking for us to deliver something, and we have to give it what it wants. Another tip for realizing what the question wants is to take note of the verbs used in the questions. So the verb is going to be what it's asking for. Uh, and be especially aware of words like not, except, opinion, etc. So we can get caught up reading through the question, and even though those words are in bold, often we can miss them and then we are finding the right information we're looking for it's just the opposite of what the question is asking for and the fourth and final tip is we need to understand uh, the terms for the target skills they use these terms like drawing conclusions making inferences uh, opinions versus facts etc and so two of the more tricky ones are an inference and a conclusion so I tried to simplify, and these are my modified definitions of what you'd find online. So an inference is basically assuming a fact based on all of the available information. So they don't tell us explicitly. They give us a bunch of information or a passage, and we're supposed to analyze it and assume a fact based on that. Whereas a conclusion would be very similar in process, so we're making an assumption based on all of that information, and the next, the next logical step beyond that. So if we were to take it beyond that, what would that tell us? So the first type of question, some type of questions you just need to know. These are what we would call the factual based knowledge questions. So there is a bunch of stuff that you do just need to learn for the GED. So if you have a look at this question, pause the video and read it. Do you know the answer? What should we fill in the blank with? So this is a civics question. We simply just need to know what this term is. So under the principle of what, the US government is divided into three branches, each with its own duties and responsibilities. And that term is separation of powers. If you don't know, you don't know. I once had a student tell me that anytime they see a fill in the blank and they don't know, they write government. All right, here's another one. This is a basic civics question. And honestly, these are the kind of things we should know as citizens of the world, especially since we are going to have the right to vote. We should be able to tell the differences between different types of government. So you can pause it and read this and see if this is easy for you. I bet it is if you've been studying at all. OK, so I hope you've had a chance to look it through. I bet you figured it out. So it says, what type of government has a king or queen with powers limited by written or unwritten rules and a legislator that enacts the laws. So some of the key terms here are king or queen. We know that that's a monarchy. Uh, constitutional, we know that that would be applicable because it has a legislator, a legislature and laws. Unwritten rules, written rules, those could be a constitution. If you're preparing for the GED, you should probably know what all of those terms are. Anyway, if we don't know this, we don't know it because it's factual based knowledge. There's nothing except for the little hints I told you. If you don't understand the types of government, there's not much you can do. On the other hand, some of the questions give us lots of information and we can learn how to sort through that. There's going to be kinds of levels of understanding. So if you look at a question in a passage and you kind of just feel like, well, I understand this topic, I'm familiar with it, and I can figure out the right answer. That's great. That's the level of skills we want to be at. However, just because we're not confident or sure about it doesn't mean we can't get it right. So sometimes what we can do is A, eliminate the wrong answers and all that will be left is the right one. Or B, eliminate a couple of them and then we can make the best choice. So some of the reasons why we could choose certain answers to be incorrect based on a passage 
or visual is if they have conflicting information. Does the answer have a term or information that's conflicting with the meaning or the terms and information in the passage or the visual? If so, we can eliminate that and choose between the remainders. Uh, the remainder. <clears throat> remainders. Next, does it have related or unrelated information or terms? So if there is some related uh, group of information or related terms, we can keep that one in the running. Perhaps is, there's a better answer, but we're going to leave it there for now. And then finally, do we have supported or unsupported information or terms? Meaning, is there anything about that in this visual? Or has the text mentioned that topic at all? Has the text mentioned that topic, but that level of detail is not within it? If so, we can eliminate those or keep them. So let's start with questions that are based on visuals. My advice, and you may hear conflicting advice, is that with any visual, political cartoons, graphs, charts, tables, maps, diagrams, the first thing I would suggest doing is reading all of the text, the headings, uh, what's in the horizontal and vertical axis, and briefly scanning the data. If you look at all that information first before you go into the questions, you're going to save a little bit of time bouncing back and forth because you know what you're looking at already. Uh, once you've moved on to your first or second question, then the first thing you could do is determine, is this question too difficult for me? Or is this question within my ability and I can just go and find the information? So if you feel confident with that, or marginally comfortable with it at least, go ahead, scan the visual, find the information, and try to make a quick, decisive uh, assessment of which is the best answer. However, if you're not so sure about it, then the best idea would be to use the process of elimination. Even if you think you have an idea, it's a better idea to go through and eliminate the other options to make sure that you've chosen the right one. I usually tell students, and I think everyone can benefit from this, the visual section is a really good place to get a lot of quick right answers because you don't have to get bogged down reading, scanning, skimming, going back and locating information in texts, which can take more time. So here we've got a simple photograph. Uh, we can look at it really briefly and see what's going on. We've got a woman with a smirk and everyone else is smiling and they're pushing the car. Old Model T, I guess. And we have a question that starts off with a little Backstory, while today's car owners sometimes have difficulties, car owners in the early 20th century had to cope with quite a number of difficult problems. Which of the following would have been the biggest concern for the people shown in the photo above? Uh, so I bet that for most of you, having looked at this photo real quick, you don't really need to actually look at the photo for information. You've got it all already. What you need to do then is just use common sense, and your knowledge of history to eliminate or choose the correct answer. So go ahead and pause and look and see which one you think is the best. So looking at A, a lack of unleaded gas which resulted in pollution. Uh, there probably there was unleaded gas and that probably did result in pollution but that was probably not one of the biggest concerns since there, was a sm there were a small amount of automobiles in the world. So A does not seem correct. B, a lack of seat belts and other safety features. It's not really supported by this. We don't have any information in the picture that suggests accidents are a problem for them. C, a shortage of lightweight building materials which led to many heavier cars than we have today. We could say that this has conflicting information because the fact that they're pushing the car and it doesn't seem like it's very difficult means even though the cars were heavier, perhaps it's not a problem for them or concern. And D, a scarcity of gas stations. Well, why would you be pushing a car? Either it's broken down or it's out of gas. That seems like the best option. This is how we can use the process of elimination to find the best answer real quick. Here we have a little more challenging visual. We've got a map with some information about the number of counties uh, with 500 or more English non-English speaking children. They've got a little asterisk at the top. We should definitely read that. So what they call non-English speaking children is children aged 
5 to 17 who speak a foreign language at home and don't speak English well or who don't speak it at all. So we've got different categories from dark being 10 or more all the way down to white being none. So uh, I couldn't fit the questions on the same page. Let's go have a look at the next one. <clears throat> we'll go back and forth between the map. So question 22 says, which of the following best explains the distribution of non-English speaking children shown on the map? So we could probably eliminate some of these without even looking at the map. Let's give it a try. So A, income taxes are lower on the coast than in the middle of the country. Uh, income taxes probably doesn't have much to do with the language a child speaks at home, but we could say it's possible. Keep it, perhaps. B, fewer children are born in states with cold climates. That is not going to be supported on the, on the map because we don't have numbers for children being born. We only have non-English speaking children. So that is unsupported. Cross it off. C, there are fewer English courses offered in the northern parts of the United States. Uh, we don't have any information related to English courses. I guess you could draw the conclusion that that's part of the reason for it. So we can keep C on as a possibility. Or D, recent immigration to the United States, recent immigrants, I'm sorry, to the United States have tended to settle in coastal and border states. That seems more likely. And let's have a look. If we look at the states with the highest population of these non-English speaking children, there would be California, which is a coastal state, Texas, which is a border state. California is also a border state. Florida, which is a coastal state, and New York, which is a border and coastal state. So that is the most supported. We do have a lack of non-English speaking children in the central northern part of the country, but there's simply not enough to make that a better answer, a better choice. So D would be the best choice. So as we can see, there are sometimes two potential answers, but this one just seems to be more supported. Looking at 23, which factor could have the least? This is something to look out for. They always give us these uh, all caps terms when it's not obvious and we could get tricked by reading it. Least, uh, not, opinion, etc. So which factor could have the least effect upon the distribution of non-English speaking children in the United States? Migration patterns. B, climate, C, ESL programs, or D, immigration laws. Go back and have a look. You can pause to remember those if you'd like. Which factor would have the least effect? So, I would say, I didn't look at the answer sheet to be honest, I would say that immigration laws would probably have an effect just by common sense. ESL programs would possibly have an effect in migration patterns, would definitely have an effect. So choosing between climate and ESL programs, we're going back to that. I would say that we have evidence to suggest that climate is less important because these are in the south and are quite hot, except for this part of Texas. California ranging from a cold mid uh, nor northwest climate to a hot southern climate. And New York being a northeastern, or, yeah, northeastern freezing climate. Those are very different. So I would say that the most evidence is that climate has the least effect. 24, which generalization is supported by the evidence in the map? Here we have a generalization. They're all going to be generalizations. What we're looking for is the one that is supported. Go ahead and pause it and read these, and then we'll look in the map again. Okay, so we have A, non-English speaking children are distributed evenly across the United States. Uh, just look back, that's totally not true, right? They're spread out all over the place. B, there are more non-English speaking children in Arizona than in California. That is patently false. There are less in Arizona than California. C, in Texas and California, more children are unable to speak English than are able to speak English. Our map does not tell us anything about 
number of children who are able and who are unable to speak English. Right away, we know D is the last one uh, because these three are wrong. So sometimes you can just get rid of the wrong answers and be left with the right one. But let's check just to be sure. There are fewer non-English speaking children in the northern middle portion of the United States than in any other parts of the country. Boom, northern middle, all white, meaning none. That is correct. That's the best generalization supported by the map. Sometimes we get diagrams like this. This is a geography-based question. This kind of question is the one I hope you get because we can simply read it real fast. Which of the following lists the points on the globe from west to east? Yeah, there's some factual-based knowledge. You need to know the cardinal directions, northeast, southwest. I bet you do. Uh, so if we just go in order, we can find that the order should be D, B, we're going from west to east, right? Yeah, D, B, A, C. D, B, A, C. D would be the correct answer. This question is also related to this map. However, when we read it, we'll realize that it's totally a trick. Hurricanes are most seriously a threat to cities along the coast of the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. Which city is not, okay, we have a not, seriously threatened by hurricanes? If we miss that not, we could pick any one of three of these cities. I'm sure you were quite well, well aware here now that there are no cities listed on this map or countries or anything. So basically this is a question that tests your common knowledge as an American. If you were like a, if you're a, a student taking this from another country to get that credential, this is a totally tough question. Uh, go ahead, pause for one second. Which one is it? Ta-da, Chicago, Illinois is the only one that's not on one of those coasts. We all know that probably. And that is factual based knowledge. That's the only way to answer this question. Here we have a, another visual that's pretty simple. Uh, and then we've got a little text passage describing what GDP is, etc., how it's used. First thing we're going to do is read the title so we know that this is the GDP per capita in Southeast Asia and Africa between the years of 1970 and 1995. On the vertical axis, we've got GDP in US dollars, or millions of dollars, whatever it is. Then we've got years 1795, and which color is which place. At this point, I wouldn't even read that, to be honest. I would look at the question first. Based on the information, which statement is an opinion rather than a fact about the GDP per capita of these nations? So, you could go back and read. This is going to tell us about GDP in general, but we don't really need to do that because we've got this big all caps word that's opinion. We can use the process of elimination just to determine which one of these is a fact and which one is an opinion. We're just looking for the opinion. So fact and opinion are really simple. Some of my students struggle with them, but all you have to think about is, would there be a record? Would, it be, would there be some proof? So we may not have access to these records, or we may not have access to the proof, but there will be proof for facts like, who was the first to circumnavigate the globe in a supersonic jet? I don't know. I have no idea. I don't even know if it's been done. But if it's been done, there's a record. So that's a fact. So let's look at A. A, the GDP per capita for Southeast Asia has increased substantially in recent years. Would there be information to tell us this? Yes. And actually, in this case, we have it. Well, this is... <laughs> This is a fact, but it's untrue. Anyway, we're looking for an opinion. Actually, no, I take that back. We don't know what happened after 1995. I happen to know that Southeast Asia has a IMF crisis two years after this, and it probably skyrocketed due to tourism. OK, B, the GDP per capita of Southeast Asia is now higher than that of Sub-Saharan Africa. Without looking at the graph, we would know. Why? There are GDP stats every year. That's, that would be a fact. Sub-Saharan Africa is in desperate need of foreign aid in order to sustain its economy. This shows that this is something we could debate. Is in desperate need of foreign aid. Is there a record of desperate need? How do we define desperate need? Maybe I don't think it's a desperate need. Maybe I think it's a moderate need. Maybe you think they don't need it at all. This is definitely an opinion. We'll check D just in case. For many years, Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa had similar patterns of economic growth. Not only could we know that there would be a record, we have a record here showing 
very similar pattern of economic growth. So C is our only opinion. So this is our last visual-based question. We'll go into some passages, and that will be it for today's video. I hope this is helpful, helpful for you guys and you're not bored by the process of elimination. In this visual, there's quite a bit of clear uh, information for us. I think you could just simply find the information you need. So it says the information in the chart was supports the uh, in the chart supports the conclusion that from 1988 to 2006 there has been what? What happened between 1988 and 2006? Well, this is all 1998 to 2006. What is it telling us? The percentage of employment changes and we got from negative five to twenty. An increase in agricultural jobs. Agricultural jobs negative something incorrect. B, more growth in administrative support jobs than in any other occupation. Administrative support jobs, 2.5%. We have 3.7, 4.2, incorrect. More growth in administrative support jobs than in service and technicians and support jobs combined. So we have administrative, what are we looking for? Administrative jobs, it's 2.5%. And we're looking for technicians and support jobs combined. So technicians and support, 2.6, and services, 4.2. That is not correct. That is much less. So we've already eliminated A, B, C. We know it's D, but let's just check. Less growth in precision production than in professional specialties. Precision production is 1.4%. Professional specialties is 3.7. That is correct. D would be the right answer. So this, you don't really need to use the process of elimination, but we just kind of went through looking for the answer, and it happened to work that way. So when you get questions based on passages, I suggest that you look at the title of the passage and read the questions before. That way, you kind of have an idea of what key terms you're looking for or what information you're looking for as you read the passage. It depends on how you learn or how confident you are. You may want to skim the passage really fast, and then go back carefully looking for information based on each question. Or you may want to read it decisively but carefully and then try to answer without looking back too much. Whatever works for you is best. So what you're going to do is, again, we're going to draw conclusions, make inferences, compare and contrast, fact and opinion. We're going to use those skills. If we can answer pretty quickly like that, that's awesome. But for the ones that we cannot, we're going to use the process of elimination. This is probably where you're going to encounter the questions where I would say that you may not actually understand the question. If you come to a question where you don't understand it and you read it again, you still don't understand it, mark that thing for review. Because you don't want to spend four minutes on a question that you probably won't get right and lose two minutes on a question that you'll definitely get right if you uh, have enough time. So we look here, we've got this pretty medium to long passage. It tells us about the Department of Labor and the Fair Labor Standards Act. So I want you to pause it and read that passage. I've actually read this one already. Okay, and so now we have another one of the questions where it's looking for a all caps except. So we know it's according to the regulations described, the following could legally be used to deny a minor employment except. So which one? cannot be used to deny a minor. I would simply just look for them. So age, 16, 7 year olds, 15, 14 year olds, 14 years, that is being used to deny them, usually prohibited. Gender, we scroll through for gender, do we see boys, girls, sex or gender in here? None. There's nothing about gender. That's probably our answer, but we'll check for hazard and type of job. Do we see anything about danger or hazard? We see protect children. That's a related term. Dangerous or ruinous to their health. This is about hazard. Negatively affecting their health. Okay, that cannot that can be used. What about type of job? Look through what we have. No types of job yet. Certain hours, uh, specific hours at certain jobs. That could be a reason to deny them. Do we see anything else? 
Oh, in the very end here. So the Department of Labor has already classified 17 non-agricultural occupations as being unsuitable. So the only one not mentioned is, mentioned is gender. So if we use this strategy, we don't have to read this thing six times trying to understand it on a deep level. We're just trying to get the answer for the question. These questions may be a different story, so let's see. Which of the following beliefs is the basis for the regulations? This one I would say you read through it and decide based on if you've read the passage once, and we already know that it's trying to protect children uh, through work ages and work hours and different jobs they're not allowed to do. We could just look through and see which one makes sense, draw a conclusion on our own. A, minors should judge the appropriateness of their own employment. This is conflicting with the entire meaning of the passage, so we'll rule that out. Employment of minors must be controlled to protect them from harm. This is quite supported. There are different controls, and harm is mentioned. Minors should not be employed under any circumstances. Conflicting information again. This is telling us how they can be employed. Or D, school children should focus on their studies and not be burdened with jobs. Though well, they do mention, this is kind of a tricky one. You could leave it in the running because they do mention something about school hours somewhere down here. Uh, certain hours as long as their employment does not negatively affect their schooling. But still, it's not saying that they should focus on something. This is an opinion. So our best answer would be B. And here we have to draw another conclusion. This is kind of making an inference, to be honest, because we've, we've been given all the information we need. The most support for the passage of the FLSA likely came from. So conclusion, inference, up to you how you decide it. Uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act. Who would write that? Who would support the passage of that? Sorry. A. Factory owners. Well, if we've studied the economic theories to this point for the GED, we know that we live in a capitalist society and it's not very likely that those of the capital would limit their use of capital and labor. So. Usually factory owners don't set limitations on themselves because they're driven by profit. A is unlikely. B, child protection agencies. That's possible. It talks a lot about protecting children. But children protection, child protection agencies don't usually deal with this sort of thing, do they? C, workers' unions. Fair Labor Standards Act. It doesn't say the Child Protection Act. That one seems more likely than B. Let's look at the last one, small companies. This one is, we're going to eliminate this for the same reason as A. Companies don't limit themselves. So we are stuck with B and C. While B could be possible, this is a tricky question. A is the more likely answer. Here we've got a, what is this? 19th century question says most of them would, were disappointed in their search for gold. Many of those who failed as prospectors settled in towns such as San Francisco and Monterey. There they found jobs working for the canneries that sprang up as a result of the booming fishing industry or digging in the gold mines that others had found. Short passage based on the California gold rush and thereafter. Nine says, which of the following best explains why men described in the passage traveled west? This is an inference. We know that you probably know this one, to be honest. Go ahead and pause and see which one you would know from your studies. So if we know anything about the California gold rush, we could read through these really quick and see that for economic and other opportunities. What was that economic opportunity? Finding gold tells us disappointed in their search for gold. D doesn't make sense, B doesn't make sense, it's possible but not likely, and A is possible but not likely. Looking at 10, they're telling us right away but you've got to draw a conclusion. Which conclusion best explains why many of those who headed west settled in coastal towns. Okay, we can probably scan for information. So why, why 
they settle in towns such as these two, they found jobs. Hey, they were able to find jobs there. This is sometimes we just win like that. That would be the first one we would find. So we would still check them. This is the kind of question you really could just read it real quick and answer it from the knowledge you gained from the passage itself, finding the related terms or the exact same terms. You don't really need to use the process of elimination. If you wanted to, to be confident that you've chosen the right answer, it's possible. So, B, there was no available land. That doesn't make sense. There was plenty of land. It's the West. C, Monterey lives, Monterey's were rich in gold. Uh, they were disappointed in their search for gold. That's conflicting. The mountains were not open to settlement. This is just madness. Doesn't make any sense. So, yep, A was our best answer. Okay, here we have another short uh, passage. This one they give us a lead-in telling us that it's an excerpt from the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. I highly recommend that you memorize a lot of the things about the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, uh, the rights of the accused. You should probably know about the functions of the Constitution, what the Articles do, what the Amendments do, etc. If you do, these kind of questions will be a breeze for you. You could read it. I would read the questions first. Which statement describes the primary purpose of the First Amendment? At this point, you can decide. Do you just read through and choose the answer based on your knowledge, or do you have to look back through and find supporting information? Go ahead and pause and see if, see if you can do it without looking at the passage. Now I'd just go through as if I were reading this. I know I am a teacher, but I think you probably have a pretty good basis of the Bill of Rights already. So A, the First Amendment protects the right to bear arms. That is not true. It's the Second Amendment. B, the First Amendment increases the government's restriction. I don't even have to read anymore. The First Amendment does not cause restriction. It gives freedom. C, the First Amendment protects essential individual freedoms, such as religion, speech, and the press. That is true. The First Amendment prohibits Congress from making laws. If you answer this question, you are going to fail the GED because D is so wrong you don't know anything about civics. So C would be the best choice. These ones have conflicting information and D doesn't make any sense. Twelve. This question tests your knowledge of the five freedoms and your basic fundamental understanding of the Constitution itself. So all of the following are guaranteed by the First Amendment. If you read that too fast, fast and you missed this except, that's how people make mistakes on questions they can get right. So be careful for these excepts, not, opinion, etc. So A, the freedom to vote, that is not included. B, the freedom to petition, that is included. Freedom of speech, included. Freedom of the press, included. What are the other two freedoms in the First Amendment? Can you recall? So the best answer for this we're looking for except is the freedom to vote. The freedom to vote is implied at this stage in the Constitution for all white males who are citizens, later to be given to African Americans at all races and women in the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 19th Amendments. I don't remember. I think it's the 14th Amendment. That's it, folks. I hope this has helped you guys. So remember, be confident, be decisive, and manage your time. I'd like to add something I didn't say, that when you come across questions that are just too hard for you, you have no idea, don't let them get you down. Don't let them throw you off. Mark those guys for review. At the end, save those five minutes. Give yourself four minutes of extra hard plowing through the questions. And when it comes to the last minute, just guess, because you don't want to leave any question unanswered. It's impossible to get a question right if you don't answer it. Okay, that's it for today's video. Thanks for watching. As always, best of luck with your test-taking experience. Take care.